even here in Brazil, there are also good examples of uh, in the northeast of changing from uh, systems that use a lot of water to systems that are more um, efficient in terms of, of, the, of the water use. And last week I was seeing one of those systems in, in, in Petrolina, very, very interesting how they change the whole system. into this. this and, and we need to promote that and do, mar, do much more in terms of um, uh, um, making governments, state governments, provincial governments, to, to invest more in these new technologies. But, but also to uh, be more efficient in terms of, uh, of waste. I mean, recycled water, different ways of recycling water. We're doing too little. Again, I mean, technologies are there. I mean, it's not a matter of, 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 of uh, discovering that, rediscovering the will. But uh, how can we make investors, private investors, uh, states, uh, investor states is the largest investor, usually in large irrigation schemes that need to be more conscious of the problem that we have ahead of us if we don't really change radically the ways we, we, we use water. Just, just as an overall comment. Thank you for the question. Um, I think your, your question is uh, demonstrating how important uh, progress in breeding and in breeding research is. Um, there are some examples, uh, for example, uh, drought-resistant maize um, is now tested uh, in a lot of different experimental field releases. Um, that might be one of a lot of different uh, issues uh, to tackle with the problem. Uh, other modifications uh, led uh, to changes in agricultural practice, like reduced till or no till. So that is possible uh, with a new herbicide resistant uh, transgenic plants. On the other hand, uh, this also might generate problems. So when this is not uh, introduced uh, into a good uh, weed management regime, uh, but uh, is, let's say, misused in a way that uh, herbicide-resistant uh, weeds uh, are supported, um, then, of course, more and more of these herbicides might uh, to have to be used, also combinations of herbicides. Um, so to use these technologies, uh, there's always a pro and always a con. And um, I think it is very important uh, to integrate these technologies uh, into the right agricultural practice. But there are at least uh, some advantages and uh, already some small solutions uh, of these problems. I didn't talk about water, but I think you know, improve the water use efficiency is one of the area every country needs to look into. I think the issues with water is that they're, first, it's not sufficient, second, not evenly distributed, and third, there's, a water, there's water pollution. So you need to work on those three aspects. You know, first, what are saving technologies, but I think all said by my colleagues, what one thing I wanted to add, even you have water saving technologies, if you don't have right institutions and incentive, people don't use it. So that's happened not only in what we've seen in China and other areas, because if the water saved are not returned with rewarding to the people who save the water, nobody is going to do it. So that need incentive as well as institution for a redistribution of the benefits of that. I just want to add that. I mean, first on water, I'd just like to reinforce the last point. Uh, certainly in, in my country, uh, the incentives are very bad for making good use of water. Uh, the economist in me says, why shouldn't water be priced reasonably like uh, other items, both uh, as an input and if the water is imputed uh, or is polluted, uh, paying a, a cost for that. Uh, but the real reason I'd asked for the mic was to ask uh, Joaquim if he could tell us a little bit more about what I might uh, think of as the political economy of, of the European Union position on things like uh, genetically modified crops. 
Uh, one part of my question is, it seems to me that recently the scientific community has taken a, what I would think was a very sensible stand. Is, is this new or is this a stand that has been taken for a long time but ignored? Uh, how does one get society to listen better uh, to such positions? Um, I think the, the establishment uh, of the position of his chief scientific advisor um, under uh, the leadership of uh, Barroso uh, was a very useful step and this has been really appreciated uh, by um, the science academies of Europe, especially by ESAC. And uh, we established uh, a very good relationship to Anne Glover. So she was really active. She took part in a lot of our workshops and uh, she established uh, the contact uh, to the European Commission and the European Parliament and so on. So therefore, I really have to say we are really shocked about the decision uh, to skip the position. Uh, and Glover uh, became under fire, uh, especially by anti-GM uh, NGOs in Europe. And um, my interpretation is that the weight of these NGOs is more important uh, concerning votes than uh, the weight of uh, science concerning votes. It's a, unfortunately a very negative statement. So, uh, uh, of course, uh, we have to work hard uh, to publish position papers uh, to, to come into contact with members of the parliament and so on. Uh, another just uh, recently quite negative uh, event um, was uh, the vote uh, by the Environment Commission of the European Parliament. You might know the discussion on the opt-out solution in Europe. Um, in the moment, um, member states uh, can decide not to cultivate genetically modified plants on the basis uh, of uh, the uh, so-called uh, precautionary principle. Um, so they can uh, decide not to grow uh, on the basis of the safeguard clause. And, um, but that needs uh, a scientific reasoning. Uh, several member states, including Germany, decided uh, not to cultivate, uh, for example, Mon E10. Uh, and uh, also Germany provided uh, a scientific reasoning which was not scientific at all. And uh, the EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, clearly said concerning all these scientific reasonings that uh, there's really not science behind. So these have been political decisions. Uh, not based on scientific arguments. Um, so now uh, there's an ongoing discussion uh, in Europe on the so-called opt-out solution uh, that member states can decide uh, not to grow genetically modified plants, not on the basis of a scientific reasoning, but on the basis of any other kind of reasoning, socioeconomics, acceptance, ethical, whatsoever. And um, we, um, the, uh, European uh, Commission together with the member states uh, found, let's say, somehow reasonable uh, solution, but unfortunately uh, the European Parliament uh, amended uh, all these arrangements uh, and um, between uh, the European Commission and the member states and they amended that in a very negative way and there was just a voting uh, two weeks ago by the European Parliament and uh, this was, again, a step into the wrong direction, unfortunately. Well, uh, my question is uh, for the three of you. In less than three minutes, I would like to listen from each of you, which is the role the science have to play concerning food and poverty er eradication? Which should be the role to play by the government? And what IAP should do? And in your uh, replies, only a comment to Linzio and to Joachim spe specifically. In both cases, when you were talking, I felt that you were saying what is wrong is people. Families don't spend on them. And you were talking about poverty. So it was a little bit uh, odd, odd to listen that 
people that don't have money don't spend on them when they have very few money and they have a lot of needs. So if you could elaborate while you are replying a little bit more on that. And with jo Joaquim also, and in this last, uh, during your talk and also during this last conversation is people are taking wrong decisions. People don't do what I am what we are proposing. And as a comment, in the field of water, people don't like dams. And they are against dams. And in many cases, we know that dam is a good solution for what they have. And we were forced to change. We were forced to provide different solutions. So my question also for you is, do, do, uh, scientists, do we need also to understand that people can the right to choice, to make a choice? So coming back to, to the last question, um, of course, uh, the voice of, voice of science is only one voice. And of course, uh, politicians uh, do not have um, to, to make uh, their uh, decisions uh, purely on scientific grounds. So that is absolutely clear. But at least uh, they should not uh, ignore the voice of science completely. And they should not use arguments which are not uh, science-based. Um, so therefore, um, of course, uh, we have to accept uh, the decisions by the public, and uh, it is very important uh, to discuss uh, decisions with the public. Uh, so, for example, I'm coordinating uh, a quite large uh, project uh, funded by the European Commission, and uh, one uh, very important step is uh, to include stakeholders. So we have been organizing three stakeholder workshops until now. We have been contacting 700 stakeholders, um, representative uh, from 50 different stakeholders uh, took part in our debate. And the debate was very open-minded, very useful. Uh, fortunately, uh, those arguments which are quite often used and which are going below uh, the belt line uh, have not been used uh, during our workshops. Uh, so, a very productive outcome, which needs a lot of effort, a lot of energy, uh, also uh, to uh, draft then the protocols, to discuss the protocols, uh, to answer uh, questions, um, to do it uh, with the highest level of transparency which is possible. But I think that is very important, especially in such a controversial uh, area as uh, GM technology and in the future also these new plant breeding technologies. I, I, I would probably add up and then I'll pass on to my colleague. I'll try to be better. I, I won't be able to answer all, all your questions because there were too many and, <laughs> and too comprehensive. Just, just to mention a few issues about the role of science in this matter. Uh, as I was saying in my presentation, there is very little land left for agricultural production to have food for the future. So definitely we need to increase productivity, which is really the obvious, let's say, uh, way out. But not just for that. We need science for also uh, developing new practices, but practices that would be suitable with the environment, but also in the um, thinking of, uh, of climate change. Climate change is a big issue that is coming up front, and we need a lot of science to develop drought, uh, uh, improve varieties, uh, we need to develop a lot of uh, new technologies to deal with climate change. There is a lot to do in, in, in that regard. Of course, we also need science in the social world, uh, in, the, in the social uh, environment for producing sound policies, policies that can be science-based, policies that can also be able to be evaluated, monitor. So th th there is a larger scope uh, for the contribution of, of science, not just for an improved production, but also for an improved distribution of food to make possible access to food to different uh, stakeholders of, of society. So science can really help us a lot to guide the way into the future to ensure that we will have sufficient food and that most, not better to say, that all people in the future can have access to food and, and, and of good quality. 
It's good to be the last to respond because some I wanted to say it's already been said by my colleague. I think there are two aspects of sciences. One is a hardcore technological generation science. Second is really social science to make the hard technology being adopted or used by the society or that. That one, I think, is more lacking these days than the hardcore sciences. Lots of technology is being put on shelf, and why? So that's the science part we need to understand to address. And then the science could provide, you know, suggestion to the government how better they can perform the role of science, you know, could because in China we they we we provide a, a lot of suggestion to the government, but we add a scientifically based suggestions to the governments. It's not really saying good heart doesn't make things to work. You need also to have rules and procedures where to make it work. So, and the second one is specifically to me address why family don't spend. So I'm not trying to complain about misbehavior of the families. I always say that every action has a cause. So farmers make the decisions based on their own rationales, based on their own limitations and their knowledge of understanding. The question is that we need to understand why. So I say Chinese family don't spend on nutrition things because they don't have security in their health care, the other things and housing benefits. They need to be more assured on that aspect before they can think about 20 years from now what the consequences are. So what I wanted to say is that everybody's rationale based on their own environment and understanding of the factors and causes. So there's no complaining about them. So I never say farmers are stupid. I always say farmers are rational and make decisions based there on their own environment. So the key is for the society and government how we can relax those constraints and making them to be more of a coherent with the sustainable way of thinking. So I hope I understood, uh, re respond to your question. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> I've been struck by the interrelationship between the, the three uh, presentations, particularly the second and the third, because as I heard the second presentation, uh, on the one hand there is a promise and the commitment to feed uh, the world by 2050. On the other hand, there is a challenge of growing uh, population, 34% you said. So I was wondering how, how is it conceivable, how is it achievable? The third presentation apparently gives the answer through the use of biotechnology, new, new forms of breeding and so on. Uh, and and uh, from, uh, from our own experience, from the African experience, you know, one thing that we also agreed was that biotechnology has to be given a chance in, in, in Africa. At the ninth meeting of African Science Academies in uh, November 2013, uh, the African Academies adopted a position, a common position, to, uh, to urge African governments to be much more uh, tolerant of biotechnological experiments and so on. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, an encouraging development. On the other hand, I was struck by another thing, uh, disturbed, I would say, by the fact that while the trend in hunger is uh, declining in the rest of the third world, in Africa it's actually growing. So what, what is the problem? I mean, is it, is it biotechnology could be one, but I don't think it could be subsumed under that just category. Uh, from your experience, from your exchange of experience with other colleagues, let's say in Africa and so on, what is it that has uh, made Africa go through this reverse trend uh, of uh, feeding, uh, feeding the population while Latin America and Asia are actually uh, being able to cope with, with hunger yeah, in a better way. I'll try to improvise the, 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 to be the first one with an answer. Of course, it's not an, an easy answer. Um, first of all, the, the, the natural resource base of, let's say, compare Latin America with, with Africa, I'm, I'm less acquainted with the, with the Asian. Uh, it's more or less the same. I mean, it's not really big. Of course, you have the Sahel, you have uh, some areas, but also you have large, very good areas with good soils, good rainfall, I mean, good conditions for, for producing. So, I mean, certainly it can be produced. So it's not 
sort of a natural environment constraint for producing. It's, it's, it has more to do with the institutionality, I would say so. It has more to do with uh, stability. Uh, if you, some, some countries have done remarkable progress, and there is also good progress in Africa. I mean, the indicators that I show uh, certainly are not good, but oh, that when you fine tune and you see that some countries are really done rather well, but then you see that those countries are countries that have more stability, that have invested most in agriculture, the countries that have more invested in, in science, education, and, and, and so on. So uh, the fragility has to do with, with certainly those, those countries that lack of institu an institutionality, that are unstable, violence, so, I mean, the, the, the explanation is more like a social construction rather than really natural conditions or other sort of con economic conditions, because some of them even are countries that are rich in terms of uh, resources, but then they have an awful distribution of income, you know, so, 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 so. So, it definitely has to do with, with um, the social arrangement for ensuring food security and political commitment to this to this big issue. You know, I mean that, that that's what the main message that I wanted to transmit when I show the, the example of Brazil. There was political commitment, political will, and then all the other things come behind. I'm not sure whether I, I understood you a question correctly, but I think what I wanted to follow my colleagues. I guess one of the key factors contributing to the success is a political will and political commitment. But the second one is that you need to have enough wealth, resources to fulfill your commitment. I think without those, I mean, social stability, institutional enabling environment, that's the key the first, in the first place. And then political commitment need to come with the materials that could support that. I think if a country, you know, you don't want to go to the vicious cycle where the poorer you are, the less resources the government have, and then the fewer you can commit. So I think I, I'm from China, so I want to use China case because what we had, the government was able to accumulate enough wealth during the reform process to materialize those promises. For example, 30 years ago, we didn't start health insurance for the rural people. We only concentrated on the elite urban drillers. That's only less than 20% because we didn't have enough resources. So we had completely separate the system between rural and urban because we didn't have enough money to cover everyone. So we might just cover a small fraction of that population. Now with the wealth accumulated, we start to extend those pro welfare programs into rural areas where health insurance, elderly care, we only, you know, uh, the elderly care scheme, insurance only kind of, kind of the system only started a few years ago. And the health care system in the country started about 10 years, 15, uh, 12 years ago. And now we have insurance for other crop insurance. All those need wealth behind it. If you don't have money, you can't. But one big chunk of a commitment for government is public investment into rural areas, roads, irrigation, and drinking water, those. So without wealth, you cannot really do. So I don't know whether I add to something Certainly. complimenting on that. So those are the experience from China, at least. So I'm uh, just a simple uh, plant uh, scientist. Um, so of course, I'm not able uh, to answer such a complex uh, question. And of course, uh, such a complex uh, problem um, like uh, food uh, security um, cannot be solved by uh, science, by plant research alone. Um, so at least to come back uh, to the, um, I think, very nice example of Brazil, there's a very strong commitment by the Brazilian government uh, to support plant research uh, to invest into research, uh, also to establish uh, regulatory frameworks which are also supporting small and medium breeding companies and which are not only supporting 
uh, the few multinational, uh, multinationals. Um, I think a very negative aspect um, in Europe, but also in other parts of the world, is that the regulatory burden for some technologies is too high, and uh, which might have been thought in the beginning as, let's say, uh, a positive step, I think turned, turned out later on uh, as a quite negative effect uh, that only a few international companies are able to uh, effort uh, to use these technologies. Uh, only they are able, for example, to pay between 20 and 40 million uh, euros to place only one event on the European market. And uh, so small and medium companies, breeding companies, are not able uh, to do that. Uh, a second step, I think, is also to support the translation of research into products. I think that is also quite efficiently done in Brazil. Um, and uh, really to support the breeders, and especially the small and medium-sized breeders, which are owners uh, of a, a fantastic uh, biodiversity. So all these uh, different uh, germ plasms uh, which are owned by different small breeders is extremely important. Um, there are some positive examples, uh, just to, uh, to cite one, that is the story of uh, BT cotton. Uh, since uh, BT cotton has been grown in India, uh, India changed uh, from a cotton importing to a cotton exporting countries, and uh, the use of uh, insecticides, and in India, they have been used 30, 40 times per year uh, by the small farmers uh, under conditions which are absolutely not healthy. Uh, the use of these insecticides uh, could be reduced dramatically, and 7 million small farmers in India are really profiting from this technology. So just to give you, I think, one very positive example. I had to step out for a minute, so the question I'm going to ask may have already been asked. But the projections are fairly optimistic for uh, food supply being adequate at mid-century. But does that factor in the negative impacts of climate change? Current evidence suggests a, a loss of 7 to 10% or so of productivity based on climate change, which is already baked into the system. Sure, sure. Definitely is a big threat. I mean, climate change. Uh, is, uh, is already uh, here. As you know, some islands of the Pacific have lost half of their land because of increase on, on the sea level. So, I mean, uh, now they are, they are not just speaking on, on how to deal with that, but how to emigrate from those islands to other islands where they can have a living, make a living. So those examples are everywhere. Here in Brazil also, there are also lots of evidence of... of agriculture being affected by, by climate change already. Sao Paulo is, is one of the, of the key issues there. So uh, we, we, we definitely need to invest much more on, on, on practices, because it's not just technology, it's also overall practices. Where are we going to have the agriculture? What sort of things need, need to be done? How can we reduce carbon emissions? And that's why I, I, I like the, the, the subject, the, the big title of this event, a call for action. We really need to do more urgent things related to, to climate change because otherwise we won't be able to, to meet the goal of, of having sufficient food for the future. As simple as that. That's my personal opinion. Can I just add a couple of comments? I think climate change is one of the scenarios we talk about. So I think the projections in the past had been based on business as usual. So I'm sure when the constraint comes, people would respond in different ways. So the key for science is we need to come up with options where people can pick and select in order to respond to it. That somehow has not been really uh, you know, really fractured in, in many cases. And also, not only the science kind of as options, but adopt, 
adaptation that happening every day with people responded with coping with daily lives, I think those has not been captured well, especially in developing world and how smart people are, especially with no local knowledge to do it. So, you know, projections can give you references, but a lot of cases is based on business as usual. So if you fractured in a lot of different responses, you might see a different scenario. So I'm not sure whether I make sense, but I, I'm not a model. So just <laughs> I think it's quite clear that climate change will come. And um, we, have to, we have to be aware of that. And we have to try to adapt ourselves and to adapt agriculture uh, to that issue. Uh, again, it is uh, very complex. It is not uh, enough uh, to try to breed drought-resistant plants or water-resistant plants, on the other hand, uh, to adapt uh, our plants uh, to climate change issues. But um, we also have to take care um, for new plant pests. I mean, um, so based uh, on, on these changes in climate, uh, also the regions were different plant pests uh, are spread will be changing and have been changed already. Uh, there's a very good uh, report also published by ASAC uh, last year uh, on plant health. And one main issue in that report uh, are already the consequences of climate change for plant health, for plant pests. Royal Society and the other UK learned societies. Uh, and the role of the Royal Society and the other societies is to see this meeting as a very important stepping stone for changing the way science in the round, a much more integrated approach to science, has greater effectiveness on the creation and the monitoring and the support for sustainable development goals and the assurance that these sustainable goals have real bite when it comes into the dealing with the main question here, which is to do with poverty eradication and sustainable development. The reason why I'm asking this for the panel is that it doesn't follow from what you've been saying this morning. This is not a criticism, it's simply a point of the confusion and complexity of the issue, that moving toward removing poverty automatically creates sustainable development. In fact, a lot of moves toward poverty worsen the conditions of sustainability rather than increase them, but they give people temporarily more money in their pockets and they help politicians and businesses and otherwise to feel a little bit more comfortable, but the long term is dire. Now, in uh, Lin Chu's presentation, two things struck me. One is that what you were talking about is not unique to China. There's a large number of people who are relatively speaking poor who are deeply malnourished, or at least in some form of extreme ill health to do with the way they eat and consume food. It's not just to do with micronutrients, we all know this. To do with. So there is an issue that as people move out of poverty, their actual eating habits are more dangerous for themselves and they're more likely to be damaging to the planet. So you had three words, things you, which struck me. You said, eat more meat. Now, for many people, that's a disastrous suggestion from the point of view of global sustainability because the meat production sector is so massively damaging. I know you know this, but it does highlight the difficulty we have in a meeting like this between making sensible scientific suggestions, which are very rounded, but at the same time trying to deal with very real political and health-related questions. So my two, three comments for the, the panel are, how much do you guys take seriously sustainable development goals and make sure that they are part and parcel of the way science is given a greater credibility and effectiveness? Secondly, many sustainable goals need to be integrated. The point about a group of this meeting is that most of the goals that they will emerge next year in the UN debate will be very packaged, slots. But what we're talking about is highly interconnected aspects of sustainable development goals. And I think the role of this particular organization in this meeting should be to make that case very clear that the next generation sustainable development goals have to be much more integrated and interconnected. And my third question, which is the one which uh, bedevils us all, is that science is only part of the way cultures change. And you made this point very well in your presentation. So one of the thoughts of, for all of you is how do we actually address cultural conditions which aren't necessarily conducive either to science as we understand it or to sustainable development as we understand it, but which way in their own ways may be highly effective 
in creating societies which can work together. So there is a tension between cultural norms which make sense and our standards of science and debate and sustainable development which often clash against cultural norms. Now these three things I think drive this particular meeting. They're not just confined to our friends here but they're particularly relevant, say, for example, in plant breeding and the family farm. How these two fit together isn't automatically put in the same words. So I think it's quite, quite difficult uh, to answer these complex uh, questions, and I think I can only provide a few examples. Uh, so what we, we raised um, already repeated times this morning, uh, your suggestion to say people should eat more meat. Um, I think from, from the, uh, let's say, standpoint of uh, health issues, you are right. Um, but uh, from the uh, standpoint of uh, sustainability, uh, of course, it might be a problem. Uh, a consequence of, uh, let's say, more meat production is uh, destruction of rainforest, uh, growing large commodities, soybean, for example, maize. Uh, in Europe, uh, we have uh, a so-called virtual land use uh, of the whole territory of Germany. Uh, so just to be able uh, to feed uh, our livestock, because we in Europe are not able to produce enough proteins, uh, so we are completely dependent uh, from the world market on soybean, on maize. And we are using such a huge territory outside of Europe uh, to produce commodities for us. So, therefore, one important step for Europe would be to use less meat. For China, it might be different. So, therefore, we need uh, not, or, or we cannot uh, provide general solutions, but we really have to, to do it case by case. Uh, another point already raised is that we should eat more fish. Um, yeah, good. Um, when we see the problems um, with uh, already eradication uh, of, of a lot of uh, fish populations uh, from, from our oceans, um, of course um, a solution might be uh, aquaculture, but uh, the problem for aqu aquaculture is that uh, in most cases uh, fish meal is used uh, to feed uh, the fishes in aquaculture uh, because uh, the fishes uh, need uh, mainly uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and uh, the omega-3 fatty acids are not provided by corn or soybean or whatsoever. There might be, again, a small but maybe very important solution uh, that plants have been developed, like uh, camelina, which are able to produce uh, omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, to grow uh, camelina on large uh, acreages, uh, producing uh, omega-3 fatty acids uh, might overcome that particular problem. But again, for that, uh, we need clear, uh, clear, let's say, better political conditions uh, to grow uh, camelina producing omega-3 fatty acids uh, under large acreages. And in Europe, it might be really difficult to do it under the regulatory conditions we have in Europe now. Yes, sure. We, we need to improve the sort of uh, interconnection uh, of different sort of policies related to the different uh, sustainable development objectives. I mean, when you try, because you have this very, uh, uh, let's say, high-level uh, objectives that are worldwide, you know, but then you need to materialize them, let's say, at the local level, you need to materialize them at the municipal level, and, and for that, you need to integrate that into sort of uh, sound policies that could have an impact, and th that's not easy when you really go down to the level by which you can really have incidents in the lives of people that are living in that region uh, and that are being affected by your decisions. So, so, so the, 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 the way in which you integrate the different uh, aspects related to sustainable development, which means social, economic, environment, institutional, uh, the different frameworks, 
uh, that, that's not an easy, an easy task, you know. But, but certainly, you, you need to have the different scales, let's say the state level, the, 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 the meso level, and, and the municipal level to integrate. So these are, these strategic, um, these sustainable development objectives are, are just like uh, big guidelines that you should think of, and, but always you have to think of, on, on the local conditions, you know. I mean, it's not the same to apply the sustainable development objective in the state of Sao Paulo and to the, here. I mean, this is totally two different worlds within the same country, within the same, let's say, policy setting, economic policy setting, and same social setting and so on. But you have totally different conditions to, to, to apply that. You have different levels of uh, uh, investments, of development, uh, of indicators that, that you need to, to, to work it out. So definitely it's, it's a big task when, when you try to translate these big sustainable development objectives into real um, uh, things for the people at the very bottom of, of the social structure. Um, cultural conditions, uh, sometimes it's not that there's always a tension between, let's say, the cultural settings, the cultural ways of doing things, and a science-based uh, sort of uh, approach to things. Uh, uh, in many cases, there is really uh, a lot of uh, wisdom in, in the ways some societies uh, do things and, and organize themselves and have their own rules uh, of the game to, 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 to do things. But you always need to have this critical view on, on what is really uh, working in terms of long-term development, sustainable development objectives, and, and so on. So that definitely uh, that critical view on how society organizes to, to achieve that is very important because in, uh, in the way you do that, you may find ways of improving the ways of, of doing things, which means generating laws, generating new proposals, developing science uh, approaches to, to different things. But you really need to have this very uh, broad picture on, on how to address uh, by first of all understanding how that particular society works and how that particular society organizes itself and how it's moving in terms of achieving these long-term overall sustainable development objectives. Can I just quickly add? Yes. I think <laughs> what I'm hearing, I apologize, I put a controversial step, eat more meat, but it's just really you need the ways to get the people eat micronutrients, elements, where meat carries a lot, but there are a lot of controversial. So my understanding of the debate is that there are always trade-offs between the options we choose. So how we avoid those kind of negative trade-offs of integrating, as you were saying. I think we've been calling a multidisciplinary approach for many years, but it hasn't been an enabling institution you know, rewarding those multidisciplinary approaches. So I think in China, we have an, <clears throat> sorry, a national office for poverty alleviation. In recognizing nature of poverty at multidimensional, you need ministries, all the ministries to talk to each other. So for that purpose, they create a body which consists of more than 14 or 15 ministries working together. Minister of Health, Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Education, and all those. So in principle, they should be talking to each other between line ministries addressing the poverty issue. Food security is one of them. But in the end, it didn't work out in that way. Poverty Alleviation Office became a unique body acting itself. So, <clears throat> there isn't a system of punishing them for not dialoguing well between the ministries. So what I wanted to say is that calling for a multidisciplinary approach, a multi-ministerial dialogue is, is not really setting the principle. You really have to have, again, institutions, incentives, 
to reward those who do well, to punish those who don't do well. If you don't have the, you know, I'm an economist, I always believe incentives. If you don't offer enough incentives, why should I do that? So I would urge that in the future, the big organization, international organization, call for proposals for addressing food security or even climate change. You need to add elements there. You have to have multidisciplinary kind of approach. Then you add the points to them. The success rate will be higher. So otherwise, people just work. It's easier to work within the same discipline because we talk the same language. We understand the substance. We understand the background rationales well. So cross discipline. sometimes we don't even understand how to communicate well between the disciplines. So that's really the challenge. In terms of, you know, one last one, how to communicate scientific message to the communities where there are cultural diversities. So I believe if you can, you know, tailor the message where to fit the cultural background, it's easier. So if, if, if you only have a scientific message fits all, that doesn't work. So in our cases, when we talk to the Minister of Education about the health problem, they said, why it's, okay, it's, I should shut up. So why should we do the uh, health? Because that's, we're working on education. But when we approve to them, if you improve health, you improve the education outcomes. Oh, it's my kind of interest. So that's just one of this. Okay, I, I stop. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, that the, good is, the good in science uh, are the doubts and the questions we, we can raise for sure. And uh, my, questions, uh, my question is uh, the, that the consequences on uh, human health uh, we have already to solve, posed by the, the food coming from GM crops. I think this is uh, interdisciplinary questions not solved yet. And, and uh, I would like to ask the group, the, the, the panelists, about uh, uh, the thoughts you have uh, in put together medical and the geneticists, agricultural geneticists, I don't know precisely the name of these kind of scientists, to ask and to solve this question of um, uh, the consequences on human health uh, coming from the food that come from the GM crops. And the second, the, the, same, the, same, or the similar question, is uh, we have been producing animal proteins, uh, in my opinion, which is almost changing the biological structure of these animals. And uh, an example is uh, many of the new infectious diseases, uh, like, um, uh, like uh, the human, the, the, the influenza or the, the flu, uh, it started in the chain of production of animal proteins. And uh, we have here a group of uh, agriculture and a group of doctors, and we can try to put together doctors and uh, people from the agricultural uh, sector to solve the question, this, this kind of questions. That is, uh, food coming from GM, uh, crops and from proteins produced in this kind of uh, transforming animals to have proteins quickly, fast, and to, to, to use by exportation, for instance. Um, so, short answer uh, concerning health effects of genetically modified plants and resulting uh, food and feed. Um, there are not only hundreds, there are thousands of uh, publications now and I think uh, there is now an agreement, there are also a lot of uh, meta-studies uh, concerning uh, health and environmental effects of genetically modified plants. And the scientific clear answer is um, that um, the technology per se um, is not causing negative effects more or less compared with con conventional breeding. Uh, of course, it depends which kind of traits you have been introducing. 
uh, of course, you have to ask other questions whether you introduced, uh, let's say, a Bt gene uh, producing a Bt toxin or you modified a complex, a complex um, synthetic pathways in the plant or you are just uh, modified, uh, let's say, one uh, simple, uh, simple protein in a plant. So my answer would be very, very clearly, and I think uh, that is agreed uh, by the scientific community, that risk assessment and regulation should be linked to the new trade, to the new product, and not linked uh, to the methodology the new trade has been introduced. And we clearly need a paradigm change in our thinking and in our regulation. I, I would just quickly mention the, the animal part, I mean, rather than GMOs dealing with. Of course, we, we have the example of mud cow disease, BSE, uh, which it's, it was, it is a disease caused by the sort of nutrition of, 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 of the cow. But for that, uh, we've been working, I mean, uh, in FEO with Codex Alimentarius to uh, improve the legislation, to improve rules, just in order to reduce the, the, the extent of the disease. And, and it's been very successful worldwide. I mean, we have less cases every year of that because regulations worldwide has improved. And that's part of, of, of the role of international organizations just to uh, provoke the debate, but also to help with technical advice on how to design bylaws that could regulate, uh, first of all, to, for risk assessment, uh, and, and secondly, to, to regulate things that could come out of control and produce serious damage uh, out of practices that are not really uh, done in, in a way that can ensure uh, safety for the consumers. The chair will be pleased to know that I had a hard question and an easy question. I'm going to ask the easy question. There have been a number of reports recently that talk about food waste. And in fact, one of the rallying points for the GM, anti-GM movement has been that we produce enough food and we need to be wasting less. The claims sometimes seem quite extraordinary in terms of the amounts of food that are wasted, either in post-harvest loss or after the consumption. So I'd, I'd be interested in your comments on that. Do we think that these quantities of food are being wasted. Is this an issue? And um, is it something we should be thinking about when we debate food security? I'll take that quickly because <laughs> I'm, I'm working in that almost every day. So, sure. I mean, uh, the, 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 the extent of food waste is too high. And we have to differentiate food waste from food losses. Food losses is something that you could, uh, that mainly comes from transfer. And, and food waste is more uh, something that you deliberately do it, you know, like when you buy products and then you don't consume and, and then it gets wasted at, at home. And that has to do with uh, changing attitudes, with, with consumer attitudes, but also um, the producers should be more aware of that. So awareness is really the key, the key issue to tackle that. Uh, there are lots of good examples uh, here in Brazil that I'm more acquainted with in which they have really uh, reduced substantially the, the, the large market of Sao Paulo is one of the examples that they are really concerned with that and they have better ways of disposing it and also processing the, the, the manage of the, of the refrigerated chain of, of products. So uh, we, we need to do much more in terms of raising the awareness and, and then search for options is more really to the users, but, but food waste at homes is, is a big, big issue that needs to be hammered uh, through the uh, different ways of communicating that, that people can change attitudes to, to food. Can I just quickly add China case? It's a good question. I think food waste in China is mainly happening in the restaurants rather than at home, I think. And then China, st uh, along with the crackdown of corruption, and China also started a movement, empty plates. You know, because lots of cases when you are in restaurant, you order a lot of food and you don't finish it. Uh, and then it didn't feel like uh, misbehaving. And these days, because of the awareness raising, it's become an issue. So we always make sure that we empty all the plates, all doggy bag and take home. So that, 
I think it, it's an issue, but uh, it doesn't happen much at home because at home, you know, people are very careful about not disposing land. You know, we we were shocked when in the states or the in the Europe, I said, you dump the old uh, bread away because in China it never happened. You consume until it's molded, so it's not really something we worry. But in the restaurant, it has been an issue. Perhaps I will have to simplify my comments or questions. I'm coming back to the GM crops issue. Uh, this is also very sensitive in Korea and Japan too, uh, because we are heavily grain importing countries, and yet uh, there is a strong resistance among the people against the GM crops. And uh, I was expecting that GEU would come up with a very clear decision on this issue, but there's a rather disappointing. And I wish only that the uh, EU can come up very soon a very positive, clear decision on GM crops. It will be very instrumental in Korea and in Japan too. And I would like to ask uh, Dr. Chang about what's the situation with GM crops in China. Do you have any policy at all? Or, uh, and the second, second issue is the, the North Korean situation. Apparently, there is a serious problem, or I may say horrendous problems about the food shortage and malnutrition, especially for youngsters and children, and uh, uh, infant, high infant uh, mortality. And there is absolutely no information outside uh, North Korea. Uh, is there any international organization who, have, who has been paying attention to the situations in North Korea. Uh, if not, then I would like to draw your attention very seriously to pay attention to North Korea and get some information at least. And if there is any way, uh, there is an immediate need for help. Uh, China may be in a better situation to do this. And I'd like to have comments on these two issues. Okay. So shortly, I'm not really a GM expert, but I think in China, what I know is that we invested a lot into GM research. That's for sure, as as a way to attack. I think in general, we are, you know, at least we think it's one of the options to solve food security, especially in a disease resistant and drought resistant the techno a kind of varieties that use in those, and because it has positive health impact, and environment impact. But to commercializing and uh, the leasing for commercialization, I think we are cautious, but positively really supporting this. But I'm not really, so don't take mine as an official one. So I'm just one of those who observing this policy. But in, in general, in terms of consumers, so consumers are mixed people sometimes because their discussion about labeling, you know, the traces of GM, we find it's very difficult because, you know, to put a mark on those itself, it takes a lot of investment to do so. But how many people are really paying attention to this is another issue. So I don't have a conclusive thing, but I think what I know is that more highly educated people tend to be more resistant to GM food than the poor and locals. So that's what I've found. Um, you are fully right that uh, our behavior and our attitudes in Europe are influencing decisions in other parts of the world. We learned it uh, from our discussions with our African colleagues. I have been repeated times also uh, in South Korea. I will also visit uh, Japan in February to talk about the new breeding technologies. And uh, this is absolutely clear. And I must say I'm ashamed about that. Um, because in Europe we have the attitude, I mean, we are rich, we are oversaturated, and we have the feeling that we do not need these new technologies, and we have to protect ourselves against these new technologies used uh, in uh, food and feed production. We have a completely different attitude uh, concerning uh, the acceptance of uh, pharmaceuticals produced by means of genetic engineering. So human insulin is not an issue of discussion now in Europe. It has been 30 years ago, and especially in Germany, uh, the Green Party was fighting 
against uh, human insulin uh, produced by genetically modified microorganisms and uh, they interfered uh, with the establishment of a, a production facility in uh, Germany, so therefore it went uh, to France and it went uh, to US. Um, the problem is that the European consumer does not see an advantage for himself in green genetic engineering. On the other hand, of course, he realizes uh, a great advantage in red genetic engineering uh, concerning insulin uh, and a lot of other very important pharmaceuticals. Um, concerning North Korea, um, so of course um, I'm, I'm not very helpful. Um, I, I only would like to, to tell you a nice uh, story because uh, I'm a German and um, when we have been sitting together with our colleagues from South Korea in the evening after some beers, uh, we did not discuss scientific issues, but they wanted to know from me how we managed the unification in Germany. First, congratulations for the excellent presentation, also the, the discussion. Uh, one thing that I, I, am, I am concerned is how the committee that uh, was created for science, for poverty eradication in the IP, will translate what was discussed here and recommend for the academy as a, as a call for action. So I believe the, the, the rapporteur, the summing up, will be very important to have a, 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 a executive summary of what was discussed here. <coughs> of course, <coughs> sending the, the presentation will be important, but also some guidelines some priorities to the academies where science can, can work in this area. So thank you. I know I'm being very uneducated, but I just have to take this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Eduardo Crio, for pointing this out. We have, number one, already your signature for the, for the allowance to be able to record your presentations. Number two, we are going to make sure that someone's going to write them down put them in some sort of sense and send it back to each of you for comments. If we get your comments, fine. If, if you're not getting them, we are going to publish it anyway. Because this is one of the things we want to do. Uh, thank you very, very much, Eduardo. We were just commenting with a couple of you. We want action. And the only thing we can really do is to try to influence whoever it is with, with the comments and the nice and important discussion we have done here. So I'm sorry, sorry, and I'm shut up. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.